the original screenplay comic of the Alien movie. Hi, I'm Simon Candlish, and welcome to Marvelous Videos. Dark Horse Comics' Alien, the original screenplay, is a comic book adaptation of the first ever screenplay of the Alien film. Writer Dan O'Bannon wrote a nearly 60-page rough draft for the film, which would later be known as Ridley Scott's Alien or Jaws in Space. But this draft went through several minor and major changes, especially when the legendary Giga joined the team. Producers David Giller and Walter Hill made several edits to O'Bannon's original work and produced a film that stood the test of time. And yet, the original screenplay was every bit as exciting as the final product. In this video, we will explore the five-issue comic and also take a look at the major differences between the film and the comic. Let's begin, shall we? Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Alien, the original screenplay, issue one. Much like the original Alien film, the comic begins in an era in which humanity has achieved technological innovations that allow deep space travel. So much so that people were bringing in natural resources from other planets that were light years away from Earth. It was during this time that a cargo spaceship named Snark was returning home after completing its objectives. In the middle of the journey, and about 39 light years away from Earth, the ship's computer detected some signals and went into swift action. And almost immediately, the ship's crew was awakened by the computer. They had been in cryosleep and were to remain in that state until they reached Earth, but they were a long way away from home. The comic then introduces the readers to several characters and sets the stage for the adventures that are about to follow. The crew is led by Chas Standard, a leader and politician who believes that any action is better than no action. Martin Roby is the first officer of the ship and she's a cautious but intelligent woman who is great at survival. The navigator of Snark is Del Broussard, a brash, glory hound and an adventurer. Communications are taken care of by Sandy Malconis, a tech intellectual who's also romantic in nature. Cleve Hunter served as the mining engineer for the mission. He was a high-strung man who would come on the mission to make a fortune for himself. Lastly, we have Jay Faust, an unimaginative engine specialist. The men and women were to become obnoxiously rich after their mission and were delighted to reach Earth. They donned their suits and went to their respective posts, but when Marconis aired the video feed, the crew was left shocked. The Earth was nowhere to be seen, and they found nothing but darkness surrounding them. Marconis tried to contact the Antarctica air traffic control, but they could not reach him. And how could they? Snark was so far away that it would have taken almost 38 years for the signal to reach Earth. The navigator, Broussard, finally managed to pinpoint their current location and informed the crew that they were not even halfway to the Blue Planet. First Officer Roby then noticed a high-priority security alert coming from the ship's computer. She learns that the computer had interrupted the course of the voyage because it had intercepted a voice transmission of an unknown origin. Upon hearing the transmission, they learned that it was definitely of an alien origin. The language was highly systematized, which signified that it had come from an intelligent species. Secondly, several sounds of the voice were inconsistent with the sound that humans or any earthly animals made. The crew had come to an exhilarating realization. They had made first contact with an intelligent alien race. Broussard learns that the source of the transmission was a nearby planetoid, which was approximately 120 kilometers in diameter. The crew was divided. While some wanted to go down there onto the planetoid and make contact with the non-human intelligence, the others, like Roby, wanted to stay away from it. Both the parties were making logical assertions, and this was an opportunity of a lifetime and the single most valuable discovery ever. But on the other hand, they did not know what was waiting for them down there. However, Captain Standard overruled Roby's request to stay put. But Standard's decision would soon prove that Roby's insecurities should have been heeded. The planetoid was quite stormy for a rock of its size, but the clouds were not made of water vapor. In fact, there was no moisture content at all. 
Amidst the dust storm, the crew gradually reached just above the source of the transmission. The dust storm was blocking any signal from radar, sonar, and infrared. However, ultraviolet vision gave a clearer picture, and they found that the terrain was a plain made of basaltic rock. While landing on the surface, the intakes got clogged with dust. Also, they overheated and damaged major components of the spaceship, which needed repair, but no one could tell how much time the repairs would need. On a brighter side, there was no hull breach, so the ship's integrity was not compromised. When they landed, the place was shrouded in darkness, but the small planetoid with a gravity zero point eight six times that of the Earth made a complete rotation every two hours, and the sun came up just 20 minutes later. While Standard was optimistic that they'd be able to see around when the sun came up, Roby was concerned that something would see them. And, of course, no one knew what monsters remained hidden on that strange planetoid. Engine technician Faust was going to take some time to fix things because the dust was so fine that it had messed up the cells on a microscopic level. The source of the transmission was about 300 meters from where they had landed, a fairly walkable distance. However, the atmosphere was made of 10% argon, 80% nitrogen and 5% neon, and the rest consisted of some trace elements. Although it was not toxic, the air was unbreathable. Bereft of any water and oxygen, the place was dead and uninhabitable, so much so that even microorganisms were absent. Broussard, the forever glory hound, volunteered for the exploration party, and two others joined him, the captain and Melconis. But the dense dust reduced the visibility to three meters. The exploration party inched closer and closer to the source in the harsh environment, and when they finally reached the location, they could not believe their eyes. Standard, Broussard, and Melconis had found some sort of spacecraft without any signs of life, movement, or light. The interiors of the spaceship were nothing like they had previously seen, but they needed to get to the control room. Using a grappling gun of sorts, Captain Standard made her way to the upper deck, and the other two followed her. Once there, they came across a fleshy, hollow object, which seemed to be the first sign of alien life. However, they soon discovered a dead alien, almost double the size of a man. This alien had spikes protruding from its body and resembled a large piece of lock. Honestly, it reminded me of Groot from Marvel. Anyway, the party moved further, and upon reaching the source, they were disheartened to find that the transmission was a recorded one that was repeated every 32 seconds. Not willing to stay there after dark, the captain decided to return to Snark. They deduced that the aliens had landed on the planetoid for repair, but could not take off again and ended up setting up an SOS beacon. While the rest of the crew acted like characters from a horror movie, willing to risk everything to find out what lies behind a closed door, only Roby behaved like a smart person and remained skeptical of the idea of going back to the alien spaceship to take pictures and collect other data. The Pyramid It turns out that on the next trip to the alien spaceship, they decapitated the alien's head and brought it back to Snark. Roby was worried about a symbol that the alien had carved on a wall before dying. She was unsure what it meant, but was confident that it was something that everyone should be worried about. Meanwhile, Broussard was continuing his exploration of the planetoid. He contacted the captain on the radio and said, there's something you ought to see. I was scanning the horizon to see what I could pick up. Take a look. He was referring to a pyramid-shaped structure and it was evident that it was an artificial structure. It turns out that the symbol that the alien had made using his last strength was his very pyramid. Roby once again insisted that they should not go to explore the pyramid, but since no one seconded her thoughts, the captain gave a green signal. The exploration party left, but by now Roby had lost all contact with them. To Roby's utter shock and horror, the computer tells her that the alien transmission was not a distress call, but a warning. It could not translate the whole thing, but managed to decipher three phrases, hostile, survival, advise, do not land. Roby called in Faust and asked if there was some way that he could achieve immediate takeoff capability. Once in the vicinity of the structure, 
the exploration party failed to notice any entrance. So, Broussard used a grappling gun and reached the top of the pyramid, which had a hole from where one could enter the structure. However, the hole was too small and only one person could fit into it. Furthermore, light did not reach the depth, so they could not deduce how down below the surface remained. The pyramid was weird in structure, as it went down like a stovepipe. Nevertheless, Del Broussard decided to go in. Broussard kept lowering himself down the pyramid to reach a level way below the surface and into a cave-like structure. The air was warm and humid, with high oxygen content and bereft of surface dust, which made the atmosphere breathable. Upon reaching the surface, he saw something unbelievable. It was like a tomb of some primitive religion, but without any signs of life. The walls were covered in strange organic matter, while a few other walls had alien symbols painted on them. Broussard explored further and came across an organic object much like the one he had found in the alien spaceship, just that these ones were not hollow, but sealed. Broussard should have been wiser touching the urns, and just as he placed his fingers on them, the area raised where he had placed his fingertips, and almost immediately, the urn broke its seal. A strange creature came out and latched onto Broussard's face. The captain was worried about Broussard because she had lost contact with him, and therefore, she decided to go after him. Upon finding Broussard, they tried to remove the creature from his face, but all their attempts failed. Fortunately for everyone, Roby managed to contact the party once again. She was about to tell them about the new development, but the captain cut her off because help was required to bring Broussard back to the ship. Upon learning about the attacked organism, Roby protested Standard's order of bringing in Broussard, because doing so would infect the ship and put everyone in danger. Nevertheless, Roby could not hold her ground for long against Captain Standard, and was compelled to let them bring Broussard in. The crew members immediately wore their medical gloves and started working hard to remove the creature from Broussard's face, but it simply would not come off, at least not without damaging Broussard's head. Nevertheless, they settled on letting the machine do its work on Broussard. Broussard was set for being scanned when Roby arrived at the scene, only to get slapped by Captain Standard. I mean, maybe she indeed deserved the slap for letting Standard bring in an alien creature inside a closed compartment. Nevertheless, they fill Roby in on the current state of affairs and examine Broussard's body on the screen. Interestingly enough, Broussard's mouth and nose had been blocked by the creature, but he was still breathing. But the MRI gave a clearer picture. It turned out that the creature had inserted something down his throat. Furthermore, the creature was injecting some dense liquid into Broussard's lungs, which was compromising the MRI. With no other option, they tried to cut off everything but the bottom layer where the creature was stuck to Broussard's face. An incision was made, and a yellowish fluid leaked out of the wound, eating the floor and creating poisonous smoke. But surprisingly enough, the creature healed itself within minutes. A miraculous recovery. The acidic blood of the creature was eating through the metal, and if not stopped, it would eat through the hull, compromising the ship's oxygen level and air pressure. However, just before breaching the hull, the acidic blood fizzled out. It was one hell of a defense mechanism that the creature used. One could not dare slaughter it. The team soon concluded that the urns that they had come across in the alien spaceship and the pyramid were not storage articles, but eggs. Although the crew were full of scientific heads, these acidic creatures were beyond anyone's understanding, and the only clue they could find was supposed to be hidden in the hieroglyphics or the symbols that they found on the walls of the pyramid. Interestingly enough, the alien spaceship and the pyramid belonged to two different races. The first had just crash-landed on the planetoid just like the humans did, while the pyramid belonged to an indigenous race. And as far as the hostility of the planet was concerned, maybe it was once a lively and habitable rock. The acidic blood had attracted the attention of the crew, and Broussard had been left unattended. However, when Melconis and Hunter came back to check on him, they were surprised to see that the creature had already left Broussard. But where did it go? Melconis asked Hunter not to open the doors or else the creature would escape. Melconis began looking for it when the creature grabbed his hand, but then it died soon after. 
That was strange behavior. I mean, the creature was just not willing to quit hugging Boussard's face. And now it just left Melconis without a fight and died without an injury. How was that possible? Nevertheless, the two of them take the dead creature to the lab where it is to be studied. However, before anyone could lay a hand on it, the creature started decomposing, which meant that its acidic blood would be all over the place. Melconis raced against time and managed to throw the dead alien out of the cargo spaceship. After nearly facing death, Melconis realized that Martin Roby had been correct the entire time. Neither should they have landed on the planetoid and nor should they have brought the creature inside the ship. Fortunately enough, Faust had repaired the ship's engines and they were ready to take off. Martine was asked to set course for Earth and accelerated into star drive. Melconis suggested the best thing to do with Broussard is to just freeze him as he is. It'll arrest the progress of his disease and he can get complete medical attention when we get back to the colonies. Strangely enough, Broussard had come back from his slumber. He could not remember anything apart from some horrible dreams about getting smothered. They were all going to get into their cryosleep pods, but before that, it was time for one last meal together. While Hunter was wondering about his money, Broussard wanted to write a book once he was back home. But all the planning came to a halt when Broussard complained of cramps. And almost immediately, his chest was burst by an alien creature. The creature had used Broussard as an incubator and was growing inside him the whole time and he did not even know it. Obviously, they could not go into hypersleep with the alien running loose inside the ship, but they could not even kill it, or it would spill its acidic blood and damage the ship. The only option that the team had was to eject the creature out of the ship. Furthermore, the crew had lost all its supplies during the harvest and only had one week's worth of supplies left. However, a week was enough to flush out the creature room by room, corridor by corridor. So it was decided that the creature was to be captured in metallic netting and care was to be given towards not injuring it. The crew was stranded in the midst of infinite space and almost like Samuel Taylor Coleridge's poem, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, in which he says, water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink. Snark's crew members faced a similar dilemma with infinite space around them, but nowhere to go. Armed with electric animal prods, the men and women began their alien hunt, but the hunter could become the hunted at a moment's notice, and everyone was aware of this. Faust came up with a makeshift tracking device. He explained, you set it to search for a moving object. It has not got much range, but when you get within a certain distance, it starts beeping. The battle plan was simple, and they were to divide into two teams and systematically cover the ship. Whichever team found the creature first would catch it with a metallic net and eject the creature from the nearest airlock. The first team consisted of Melconis, Roby and Faust, while Hunter and Captain Standard constituted the second team. After walking a bit, the first team picked something on their tracker device. Step by step, they inched closer, but the needle was pointing in every direction. Tensions were rising and hearts were pounding. Ultimately, they closed in on the moving target and placed a net on it, only to realize that it was the ship's cat. But just then, Captain Standard radioed in and informed the first crew that she had found the creature and that it was trapped in the food storage room. Hell breaks loose. The creature inside the food storage room looked completely different from the previous one that they had encountered. One could say that this new creature looked more like a worm with legs and numerous tentacles. Faust suggested that they could pump poison gas into the room and kill the alien. However, this was far from an option because all their food supplies were in there and poisonous gas would destroy the food. As the crew discussed their plan of action, the storage room suddenly went silent. It was decided that it was time to enter the room and face the monster for themselves. However, the alien had managed to escape through the vents. Unfortunately enough, the vents went all over the ship and naturally the creature could have gone just about anywhere. But Faust noticed something crucial. He said that one section of the ventilator shaft has only two outlets. Hunter added the food storage room on the one end and the cooling unit on the other. So the alien was trapped somewhere in between these two points. 
and all they had to do was flush it into the cooling unit. One of them could use a flamethrower for the purpose, but the important question was who would be the one to enter the ventilator shaft? The job was definitely a tough one, and the team came up with a rather democratic idea. Five white papers were rolled into balls, and one of these papers had a cross on it. The one to pick up the marked paper would be the one to crawl down the ventilator shaft. As it happens, the toughest member of the group, Hunter, was the one to fulfill this task. A determined hunter began his mission, while the others waited in the cooling unit to trap the creature. But their elaborate plan was about to go for a toss. Out of nowhere, the creature revealed its presence and decapitated Malconis with its bare hands and took away the rest of the body. Sadly enough, Malconis's body was still moving like a headless chicken when the alien took away the body. Nevertheless, they realized that capturing the creature or killing it was out of the question because it had grown large enough. To make things worse, the flamethrower was also out of fuel. But Faust had a solution, and he told Hunter that there was one more fuel in the storage locker next to the ship's lounge. Captain Standard gave him permission to leave, but he warned him about going below deck. While Faust went on his fuel hunt, Martine implored the crew to look into the hieroglyphics that they had found under the pyramid. Although there was a meaningless pattern, a closer look revealed a few recognizable forms. Some of these symbols represented a very stylized version of the creatures they had been dealing with. In the end, she deduces, this is all the same creature. We are seeing the different stages in its life cycle. It turns out that the pyramid was some kind of fertility temple where eggs were stored and mating rituals were held, and Broussard got himself caught in the creature's reproductive cycle. Interestingly, this behavior is quite different from the xenomorphs that we got to see in the movies or other comics. Yes, they are social beings that live in colonies, but the aliens from this comic are social beings that have a culture and language, and naturally, they are intelligent and capable of forming a civilization. Meanwhile, Faust finds a creature in the main airlock and contacts Roby, asking her to blow the main lock, but the alien senses Faust and chases him. Unfortunately for Faust, he gets trapped between the locked door and gets cut in two. It seems like Faust's death that make the comic more readable and enjoyable. Such graphic scenes can never be found in a good mainstream movie. With Faust gone, only Captain Standard, Hunter and Roby remain alive. And because of the adventure with the main airlock, the ship lost a huge chunk of its oxygen and only six hours worth of oxygen remained. Hunter had begun to let himself drown in despair, but Captain Standard was more optimistic. She said, there is still time to destroy it and get it into the freezers. I want to hear every suggestion you can come up with, no matter how wild. Roby came up with an idea. She suggested that they could escape on the lifeboat, but Standard pointed out that the lifeboat only had one cryosleep chamber, and naturally, only one of them would survive. However, the idea was turned around, and it was decided that they would lock the creature in the lifeboat and eject it into space. But that was not going to be easy, because someone out of the three would have to serve as bait. And much like the last time, the three of them led it upon fate to decide who amongst them would serve as the bait. The conclusion. Martine Roby was the one that got selected to do the job. Hunter gave her explosive sticks that were easy to carry and could be detonated remotely. She was to wait by the lifeboat while Hunter and Standard drove the creature towards her. Once it was there, Roby would close the hatch launch a lifeboat and blow it up. Roby reached her position and the other two began their search for the beast. However, the alien ambushes Hunter from behind and slaughters it. Standard fires the flamethrower on the creature, but it uses Hunter as a shield and Standard's fate was no better. Roby lost contact with her colleagues and understood that they were as good as dead. And now there was no one left to drive the alien to the lifeboat, which meant that she had to come up with another plan if she wanted to survive. Martine Roby was a survivor and likewise, she was quick to recall another way to kill the alien. She turned off the cooling units of the star drive engines and it resulted in overheating the maiden's core. She now had 4 minutes and 30 seconds to reach the lifeboat before the main core would melt and explode the cargo spaceship. She raced against time to enter the lifeboat and eject it from the ship. And it wasn't before long that Snark exploded into pieces. Unfortunately enough, the alien was also present on the lifeboat and was pursuing her. She got herself enough time to wear her spacesuit. 
after which he opened the hatch. The vacuum sucked the alien out of the lifeboat, and just as it reached the jet engine, she activates the ramjets, which burn the alien, melting it. And finally, Roby was able to get into the freezer with a cat and head to Earth. The comic started off great, and they managed to build a nice setup for the alien's arrival. But midway, they rushed in to finish the line, almost like they skipped an issue altogether. Differences between the 1979 film and comics. The original screenplay and the 1979 film have similarities in the second and third acts. The facehugger, the chestburster, and the fate of Martine Roby and her cat are reminiscent of the film. There are a number of differences between the pieces, but there are also many differences. Let's explore the top five of these differences. The Aliens Ridley Scott and James Cameron's Xenomorphs are tenacious and clever hunters that live to kill and kill to live. Also, they follow a similar reproductive and social structure as a colony of bees or ants. The colony is divided into several castes and is ruled by a queen, who is the biggest of all and lays eggs. However, the original screenplay comic tells a different story. In the comics, while Roby studies the hieroglyphics, she learns that the aliens have four-stage reproductive cycle, and each of the aliens is capable of laying eggs. This was in contrast to the second film of the franchise, where James Cameron makes it clear that only the xenomorph queen has the potential to lay eggs. Furthermore, we learn that the aliens in the comics lived in a more civilized colony and were capable of writing a pictorial language. Naturally, the comics aliens are far more intelligent and superior to that in the films. Furthermore, the alien looks very different to what Giga created. The sexual symbolism in the alien's anatomy is clearly absent. But yes, there's that whole impregnation thing present. The souvenir. While well, Ridley Scott's Prometheus was based around the space jockey and the protagonist's quest to find the creator of humanity. And although the crew of Nostromo from the original film discovers the dead body of an engineer, they do not take any souvenirs. When Ellen Ripley is rescued after 57 years, no one believes her story. However, the final girl from the comic, Martine Roby, manages to bring back the skull of the pilot that the crew had found in a crashed spaceship. In fact, it's her ticket to wealth and fame and also something that would prove to others that she was not crazy. The journey back home. When Ellen Ripley slept in a cryosleep pod, she had no idea when exactly she would reach home, and she was found by her evil corporation after 57 years. However, it seemed that Roby is well aware of the duration of her journey. She says, so it looks like I'll make it back to the colonies after all. I shall be there to the frontier in 250 years or so, and with a little luck, the network will pick me up. This gives way to another small difference, since the time travel is shorter by 193 years in the comic. Roby was farther away from Earth than Ripley when she started her journey. The Race Against Time Ridley Scott's film and the comic share the plot point in which nature's fiercest killer is hunting a world-class crew. However, there's a difference as far as the circumstances are concerned. Scott's alien is like a psychopath in a closed space, waiting and plotting to kill the crew members one by one. It takes its sweet time to make the next kill. However, the comic adds another twist by bringing in a six-hour window, after which the crew members would die anyway. So, as I mentioned earlier, a catastrophic event breaches the spaceship's hull, which results in only six hours worth of oxygen remaining on the ship. If the crew failed to kill the alien and get into the freezers within this time, their end was imminent. No Big Bad Corporation The comic does not show any evil corporation like Wayland yutani and naturally there are no ulterior or corrupt or greedy motives behind the crew landing on the planetoid. This was also the reason why the comic did not have any synthetic on board to further complicate the lives of the crew members. And like in the movie, all the people on board the ship rather gel well and seek together. There are hardly any fault lines between them, and I believe this really works in favour of the story. All in all, the original screenplay 
was a fine comic, but could have been better. The graphics are at their best while portraying the gory and visceral scenes, but they could have been a tad bit more dramatic. A few panels tend to give me a feeling that the artist was in a rush to just finish their work. Nevertheless, it is a suggested read for any horror fans and a must read for all Alien fans. With the new Alien TV series in work, I think it'd be a good time to pick up the first ever Alien storyline. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe.